Hello and welcome to Global Sanctuary for Elephants podcast, Global Rumblings. Global Sanctuary for Elephants, or GOC for short, is a non-profit organization with a mission to create vast safe spaces for captive elephants where they are able to heal physically and emotionally, often from very traumatic pasts. I'm your host, Nadia Mari, and I'll be taking you to the lush jungle of the Mato Grosso region in central Brazil, home of GSE's initial project, Elephant Sanctuary Brazil. Currently home to six female Asian elephants, lovingly referred to as the girls. Hello and welcome to episode number eight of Global Rumblings. Today we are going to find out what was the fish house. We are again joined by Kat and Scott Blaze from Global Sanctuary for Elephants down in Brazil. And we will be continuing traveling around Brazil looking for suitable properties for their first sanctuary, their pilot project in the Mato Grosso region. Hi, Kat. Hi, Scott. <laughs> hey, Nadia. How are you doing? Hello. I'm fine. Spring is still in the air. Yeah, days are getting lighter. So, uh, yeah. Well, things, Fantastic. things are getting darker over here right now. We have some storm lingering off to the south, but we'll see how it goes. Okay. It's beautiful right now. It's, yeah, we could sit here for a long time looking over this. We can the sanctuary value. It make a drinking game out of how many times you say it's beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> it's, <laughs> <this podcast. laughs> it's stunning. <laughs> We can have a bingo. Yeah, we can have bingo. Sanctuary bingo. Yeah, it's <laughs> it's amazing here. It really is spectacular for, for everybody. We just received a small deer also um, with part oh. of the wildlife that we, wildlife rehab uh, here in Mato Grosso. Was, it's one of the largest states uh, in Brazil and they do not have any official wildlife rehab release program. Uh, they do okay. have some impromptu. They do have the state regulatory agency is has uh, a small project, but they don't have good sites to release them or anybody that needs any sort of long-term care. Uh, so we have right now a baby taper and a baby deer oh, that just arrived who is just too cute for so words. Cute. I was going to say beautiful, Aww. but then somebody would have to drink again. So I would say beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they really are So precious. where do they come from then? If you say that they haven't got... Uh, very good areas to release them back into. So where have they well, come from? A then lot of places. They don't have anywhere. They have a lot of areas to just do a hard release. If you're just going to go release something somewhere, uh, but they don't okay. have a lot of anybody that needs long-term uh, developmental care, uh, like this young deer, you know, it's either here or, you know, somebody's basically bedroom, <laughs> you know, they ended up being very much humanized and, uh, and raised by humans and, and fed inappropriate, uh, 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 nutritional supplements and such. So we're trying to amplify our program so we can actually work with the state more, work with some of the local folks in the main cities a little bit more. This little one came from the capital city of Cuiabá, the little deer. Oh. Uh, but we don't know ex the only history we know is somebody reported it as being orphaned, but highly likely, as we see around the world, is somebody happened upon a baby deer who its mom had told him to hide somewhere and was hiding oh. for the day. And they just assumed that he had been abandoned, even though mom's out getting herself nourished so she can keep raising this little baby. Um, oh, no. And unfortunately, probably when mom came back, the baby had already been picked up and uh, moved to Cuiaba. And the place they have there is just basically a concrete holding pen. Uh, so they sent him to us as quickly as possible. And he's he's doing pretty well. Well, that is great then that the word is spreading that you are only uh, that you are not only taking care of elephants, but also that you have this uh, wildlife uh, rehab program and then the, the deer and the tapir then like other animals will then be released into your property yeah we just once they go th through a few different stages of, of rehabilitation and adaptation then we just open up the gate and they just walk out and they will be greeted by many other wild tapers and deer in the area and of course it's not that simple they start in smaller pens where we can monitor them closely and adjust their diets so their space expands 
Yeah, as they get better with feeding themselves. I mean, because they're both milk babies. Um, And then we have, I think it's two acre yard. That is the last step before their release into the property so that we can watch them, but make sure that they can also live off the land and do what they're supposed to. So one of the next projects, and I know we're a little off topic here, but this is where, where <laughs> this is what happens this, when you talk to us. <laughs> <laughs> this was how no, when great. you overlook the property and see how beautiful it is. Uh, one of the things <laughs> that both the there's two there's a state version of the federal agency called IBAMA, um, and then SEMA is the just the state uh, environmental agency. Uh, they have both asked us if we can take larger uh, larger birds. And so we're in the process of trying to build two flight cages, one for smaller birds, one for large, larger birds, because they don't have that option either. Right now they have a scissor tail uh, hawk uh, that, wow. that has been there for a long time, but he they don't have any flight cage for him. They don't have anywhere they can exercise uh, for him to grow before he can be released. So we'll be working on that here soon. Yeah. So it's not about keeping him permanently. It's about having a flight cage that is big enough for him to build up the muscle tone that he needs to be able to, again, live out in the wild world. And, you know, with certain birds of prey, you have to make sure they can catch their own food and so on and so forth. Mm. So again, it's not an easy or quick process and you want to make sure you do best by them before you let them go to give them the best chance of actually surviving when you do let them go. So they don't have any flight cages in this state at all. So, okay. We are going to try to build two. Wow. And talking of birds, I can hear little, well, not only today, but in all recordings, uh, little chirp noises. So you're just surrounded by wildlife. Well, wow. it's just amazing. Yeah. It's kind of funny. I left a message for Trish the other day. Who's been here? She's one of our veterinarians and she's been here for months at a time. And she was like, what is going on with the bird party? Because it was just (laughs) one of those days where all the little parakeets were there and the macaws were in the trees. All the songbirds were out. It was very, very noisy, apparently, in my message. Wait till we have males. And I think we did a video of Lady in the mail yard recently uh, that hasn't been published yet of all the little parrots coming back. There's a bunch of palm trees there where several types of parrots and little parakeets and parrotlets come back and they are so noisy. (laughs) All the different frogs and so happy. And, you know, at the end of the day. Normally it's the roosters, isn't it, that are noisy? (laughs) Uh, But uh, it's the the wildlife. But um, so, as you said, we're getting off topic. Refocus. I don't really think anything, anything in sanctuary is really off topic, but to be able to offer wildlife rehab for deers and for baby deers and for tapirs and just to enjoy all the wildlife, the birds, you had to find this property. So we will, uh, <laughs> totally different topic than the, than the last episode. There's silence on our side when you talk about having to find this property, the trauma, <laughs> the trauma of it all. We eeny, meeny, well, miny, yeah, moed it and we just randomly picked this place because it was easy. Yeah. Yeah, so we had elephant trauma in the last in the last uh, episode, and now obviously we're back to back to your trauma, and uh, about uh, yes, living next door to a school, and uh, that was episode six, wasn't it? Listening to to, to just the drum line, which is buried deep in your heart somewhere that you said. So um, you will have to share before we actually then set off to find find this property. Um, What was the story with the fish house? I mean. We had the we had the uh, the non house trained <laughs> mice who'd pooped everywhere. So what was the fish house? The the drum line still makes me go into a little bit of a stereotypic repetitive <laughs> pattern. <laughs> it's okay. It's long story dense. short, we after being moved out of one house and being told they had somewhere else we could live, it was this what used to be Casa de Peche, which is a fish house. And it was closed down and there was nothing going on there. So there was a little apartment in the back. It wasn't an apartment. I mean, it was an office. It had a desk, you know, like a full size desk that took up the whole one room that we turned into essentially our living room and a smaller office, which we made the bedroom and then like a tiny little pseudo kitchen it only had a sink it didn't have anything else (laughs) and stuff looking at me and smiling um so they told us it was closed not a big deal we could live there blah 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 there were all these little 
issues that we chose to ignore. We had like a little camping stove, but we couldn't cook in the house because it smelled like propane. So we had to take it out of the house, which is fine. The weather's nice. It's beautiful. We can manage. We had our little college fridge. And then they started to have people show up at the fish house. So we were like. It was closed. Yeah. Yeah, It was like a little bit in front of where the office was. Yeah, it's attached to where we're living. So essentially what we made our living room has all glass windows that we covered up. And in front of that is a bunch of freezers and a little like fish store. (laughs) And they opened it and they said it was going to be open. What did they say? It was just going to be just weekends, not a problem, blah, 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 blah. And you can't really complain because you're living in a house for nothing. And And it was the, it was owned by the mayor of the city. I mean, she was very generous to let us stay there because the reason why we had to move out of the other house was political. It was different political factions uh, within the city. One wanted it for something else. One wanted us to be able to continue to use it. And there was internal dilemma with them. Uh, And, and, you know, because of that, the mayor, offered up her fish house for us to stay in. <laughs> yeah, so we figured weekends wasn't a big deal, although I have to say I do slightly have privacy issues. <laughs> so <laughs> I was like, mm, okay. Um, but then of course, just on weekends went to every day and then was the request of, you know, the people that are working there, can they come in your place and use your bathroom? Because there's no other bathroom oh. except for that one. So Again, not feeling like we really have the right to say no. I mean, because they're letting us stay in this place. We're like, okay, sure, you know, whatever. So that meant essentially keeping the door unlocked between where we were living and the fish house. And of course, they show up really early in the morning and leave whenever. But then they started letting patrons of the store come in and use the bathroom. And then there were people who were working in there that had their little kids there that they were letting them use the bathroom. And I mean, you would like literally go to walk past the bathroom. And this is amusing to me because I don't have (laughs) children. And there's like this little six year old boy with the toilet seat up peeing everywhere (laughs) in the bathroom. I mean, like door open, doesn't close the door, like like peeing on the toilet, the wall, the floor, like everywhere. And then you're like, okay, this is awesome. (laughs) This has gone slightly too far. Um, But again, you didn't, I mean, what are you going to (laughs) do? Well, there have to be boundaries. Okay, I'll go back on what I uh, said in the introduction. It wasn't entertaining. It sounds like a nightmare. So uh, before you uh, re- revisit and relive any other trauma, let's uh, let's let's move out of the fish house, fish house quickly. <laughs> out of the fish house quickly. That's a bit of a mouthful. And um, I don't know, pack our bags, go somewhere else, or continue uh, traveling around until we finally find where we are now. Although Scott once said, "Oh, we're five episodes." Away Away from that, so I don't know how uh, how close we are to uh, actually reaching the sanctuary where you are now. But uh, I'll let you to decide. Yeah, before we started talking about the fish house, I think we had talked about finding a property just before going to a pause conference. Uh, that was really promising, yeah. and I don't remember the detail of how far we went into that, but it was really a remarkable property, uh, gorgeous. It was owned by friends of. Uh, we talked about it a little bit. Yeah, and then. Uh, as that evolved, actually, when we got back from the pause conference and started digging, digging a little bit deeper, um, we found out that it also had uh, some long-term permit issues. Um, yeah. And there would have been a way around that, but it was going to take a long time to get there as well. And that was kind of the last straw uh, for us in that town. We had searched, we had been there for almost nine months at that point. Uh, let's see, December, so about six months at that point. Um and just dead end after dead end after dead end, you know, even with things that seemed promising, just weren't going to work. And we had already been in the process of looking nationally uh, at various locations. We had talked further up north. We had, you know, plotting some areas up near the Amazon, uh, which would have been very problematic, <laughs> although uh, in our 
attempt to be as diligent as possible and not close any doors, you know, that may actually be viable. We had to do the research and had to look into all those options. And there were some that had carbon offset projects where they were land was preserved for carbon offset, uh, but they could still be developed in certain parameters. So we started looking to see if we could work with somebody like that, that had a piece of land that we could then use and almost have this collaboration, this joint partnership. Uh, continue to look online. Uh, we were looking way at the east of Brazil, um, almost on the east coast, uh, uh, several times and several properties there, almost to the point of flying there to look um, directly. And then we started, uh, I found this particular property that we purchased online um, and it was just stunning. It was, the pictures were absolutely amazing. And we said, we just have to go look at it and see what that region offers. Um, a couple, we came here twice. I came here twice. I was going to say you came by um, yourself initially. The first time I came, it was, I looked at this property and I thought it was all too steep. <laughs> um, and then I looked at other properties and it was a little bit more money than we had hoped to pay per, per, per hectare. Um, looked at other properties as well, but nothing was ideal, but there were many more options available to us here and proximity to the state capital was going to be beneficial um where we were with the fish house and, and and the schoolhouse that was we're in the middle of nowhere here that was like way 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 middle of nowhere it is even for brazilians that yeah. is middle of nowhere yeah we okay. right now we're about three two and a half to three hours from the nearest airport from the the, the state capital airport uh if we were in the city we were in in the north in guadalta the properties, many of the properties were about two hours away from the city and the city was another two oh. hours or three hours to the nearest airport. And that airport would get you to Brasilia or Cuiaba, <laughs> you know, so you don't oh. get very far from that airport. It's really, really teeny closet of an airport. Uh, so all of the things, all the logistics would have been much more difficult there. Um, so when I came to visit Chapada dos Gamenez, the municipality, um, I went back, came, like I said, I came here twice and Katniss said, let's, what do we have to lose? Let's move there and see if we can make something work. Cause there were ready, there were many more options. <laughs> it's not like we were getting anywhere where we were or that life was so stellar there that we couldn't tear ourselves away. We were gifted two kittens by that point. So we had us a suitcase maybe of stuff and two kittens easy yeah. enough to so move Bodhi and Safia. Bodhi and Saffron, yeah. Aww, yeah. We had been talking Saffron. about how we missed, um, we had been talking about how we were missing our dogs at home because we didn't want to bring them. They were older, you know, I think at that point, Until maybe we 11 and 13. Mm. So we wanted to make sure we had mm. a place to stay before we brought them here. Cause we didn't want to mm. be shuffling around Brazil with our two older dogs. And somebody dropped off two kittens on our front step instead. <laughs> and they were covered in fleas and covered in fungus. And being vegans, we had nothing to feed them in our refrigerator or our house at all. We didn't have any milk. And it was Sunday. And in the area we were in, everything is closed on Sunday, even the supermarket. Oh, no. So, um, yeah, I don't even remember what we managed to feed them until the next day and then went out early. Maybe an egg but or something from the neighbor. I don't remember what we did. They ate, but I think they had a little bit of food in this thing. <laughs> yeah. Probably not after. They were covered but, in fleas. It was a mess. Uh, but all in all, that worked out pretty well. It was a little bit tough to leave there only because there was support from the city. The mayor really wanted the project. She had, you know, tried many ways to help us as well. And yeah, it's hard a to lot of really away. nice people. It, you know, even our friends, Nacieli and Paolo, we mm -hmm. adored them. She had her babies by then who are so big now. Um, but, mm -hmm. you know, yes, there were things that were really nice about being there. But as far as moving forward with Sanctuary, it just wasn't going to happen. So... It was actually after that last property, the one that was so gorgeous, didn't work out. I was talking to a realtor um, and he is the one that said, you know, he also said to me when I told him we we're leaving, he said, you need to. He said, this is not the place for you. He said, mm. culturally, it's not going to work for you here. It's, uh, you know, much too agricultural minded, um, you know, very much not the conservation, <laughs> conservation protection is the region that we really had hoped to find up there. Um and Chapada is great. I mean, it's it's touristy in that it because of the caves and the waterfalls and the bird watching and the Pantanal being three hours away and everything like that. You have a lot of 
biologists, a lot of tour guides, you know, along those lines and people that are coming through here are very environmental, Mm -hmm. I guess, and appreciative Mm -hmm. of that sort of thing. So it ends up being a much better fit for having a project like this here. Yeah, there was actually concern when we started talking about there was concern of the impact of the elephants on the environment here, which that wasn't the case in up north, uh, which, you know, maybe, you know, that could be perceived as, you know, people being anti-sanctuary. And it wasn't that they were just making sure the project had been thoroughly analyzed. They just didn't want people coming in here and destroying the place. Sure. I mean, unfortunately, Mm -hmm. there have been many poor relationships, especially with U.S. NGOs coming into Brazil and not doing right by Brazil, whether it be with the money they've made and took off or ruining projects or whatever it is. So there was definitely a little bit of concern with it, but that's fine. And there's a lot of land degradation in the area because of agriculture here. Uh, it has changed mm. a lot in all over in Mato Grosso. It's one of the it's one of the states. I think we talked about it before. It's one of the states that when you they show the progression of Amazon uh, devastation, you mostly see Mato Grosso. <laughs> Not anymore because it, they've actually it started to progress further. Um, <laughs> do you hear that little bird? Yeah, I do. It's a woodpecker. He just landed on the house. A woodpecker. Mm-hmm. Oh, He's beautiful. I heard the little chirp. Oh, he almost flew into the house. Our house is very open, clearly. But now he's. Oh, you still haven't got windows. No, we don't have windows. We don't have doors that are closed right now. So it's very open. (laughs) So how did you then find, um, you can see I was nudging you in that direction. So how did you then find the property where you are now? Was it, was it a private property? So you moved away from the fish house down to the region where you are now, and then you just set off talking to realtors again, although you said yeah. you had mentioned that part of the property you found accidentally online. Yeah, this property, the, the property we ended up purchasing was online. It was 600 hectares, uh, privately owned, uh, stunning compared to most of the properties that we had seen. We uh, had some contacts, uh, some uh, friends uh, friends who were in the area. Uh, so what I ended up doing is, you know, we came here and down here for two trips. Um, friend of a friend put us up at a hotel and got us in contact with a couple of realtors. And they started showing me different things, different properties uh, during those two little, you know, I think it's two or three days that I came each time. Uh, and then that's when he decided, let's just move there because there's a lot more options. We found somebody in uh, through a friend of the hotel that I was staying at. Uh, his name was Julio. Uh, Julio is a really, really nice guy and so grateful that we got to meet, meet Julio. Uh, he's a tour guide, but also a uh, by trade, he's a, a lawyer. Um, although oh. he said he got tired of fighting all the time and became a tour guide. Uh, just a brilliant, really kind person. And uh, one of those where we'd be walking down the street with him and somebody would randomly walk up and he said, you're Julio. And he said, yes. He said, I'm sorry, I don't remember who you are. He said, you helped my mom when no one else would. You know, and there's these multiple no. stories of this guy just pouring his heart out and helping really anybody and anywhere, just a really genuine person. So, and he knew everyone. He was, they joked about him being the town mayor. If I went to the Sunday, uh, the Saturday morning little farmer's market, if I could go by myself as, you know, 30 minutes, I could buy our weeks full of groceries and uh, all fresh stuff. If I went to Julio, it's going to be two and a half hours because you have to talk to every single person because <laughs> he is the town mayor. Um, this is a really good guy, but opened up a lot of doors for us and made additional contacts. And he rented, uh, he had a house for rent that we stayed at. Um, in this, in the, in the main city, which has its own stories, but another time, cause let's get to the property. Um, you know, when we st- started looking at more and more properties and this property, although it was ideal in many ways, it still was not a hundred percent, you know, it was larger than we really could afford much larger than we could afford and much more money than we could afford. Um, but it was ideal. Yeah, it was just with every property he went and saw, we still ended up coming back to this one over and over and over again. And it's one of those, at some point you have to realize you just have to stop fighting clearly what what the planet's trying to push on you, what the universe is shoving down your throat, I guess. But it also wasn't, you know, and I said it wasn't a done deal. It took a long time. You know, there was the title search and the title here was, it was... the. It's very convoluted here. Um, the <laughs> yeah. owner of this 
600 hectares. Um, we told them what we were looking for, and we were concerned about some of the neighboring lands because two of the neighbors had to go through our property to get to their property. And okay. uh, we were concerned about how that would work because we couldn't buy all of them. You know, there's no way we could do that. So he actually took the initiative, the owner uh, took the initiative and said, what if I organize those contracts in my name? I'm the one that purchases them to, for, for you and I sell everything to you directly. Wow. So it was not only his title, uh, which was six different parcels all looped into one. Uh, there was which also again is typical for Brazil. Yeah, that's just the way it is. Mm. There's the 48 hectares in the middle, which is a very small plot right in the middle, but most fundamental. Uh, it had two different titles, and then the two properties in the back on the other side of the river. Uh, they also had multiple titles, so all those had to be researched and analyzed to see if the titles were actually clear because it's a big issue here in Brazil. Mm. Uh, and then the other issue was funding and money. And, you know, this was a property that was a million US dollars and we wow. had nothing. And they don't do <laughs> bank loans for properties. They don't do bank loans for nonprofits, for really anything. Yeah. Uh, even financing for uh, like a, a, a vehicle or um, uh, a tractor or anything like this. You can't get financing as a nonprofit unless you have somebody that can fully back the loan. And a private individual okay. that will co-sign and can fully back the loan, which is really hard to find when you are a new nonprofit in Brazil. And um, you want to buy a property that costs a million dollars. Right. So <laughs> the other thing that happens here is financing isn't a 30 or 40 year loan. It's normally two to five years. What? Um, two to five years, a million dollars. Wow. Yeah. So we were like, okay, this is the perfect property, but how can we possibly make this work? So we were talking to the landowner, uh, who was a really, really good person, a very, very kind person, very generous with his considerations. He should have walked away. Everything business minded, any logical person would have said, sorry, you know, we're out. You know, I'm not going to sell this property to you. But a couple of things came uh, came into play. Um, one of them was he was willing to owner finance for five years. He was willing to take 10% down payment. And we had 2% down payment. <laughs> um, actually, I think we had 1% down payment, That's actually, to be, to be truthful. Um, so he was willing to do 10% down payment and, and do a series of parcels. And we ended up uh, finding a way to break this contract work where he took very small uh, down payment. We were able to do payments over five years and he signed a contract uh, in the contract that stated if we had to forego payment or we're not able to conclude uh, the purchase of the property, anything that we have paid for, we keep. So that gave us wow. the security to be able to move forward as a nonprofit that is young, that had to had elephants waiting. We need to get something started. Um, you know, we didn't know where financing, how financing was going to work out. We just knew we needed to start getting elephants here and didn't have time to wait. And so we ended up moving forward and he took, you know, a huge leap of faith in us. And our board of directors asked, said, are you sure you want to do this? And it's like, we really had no choice because we're here for now, you know, nine months, uh, almost a year at that point. By the time, was, I think it was almost a year when the contract was finally signed. It was the middle of June, middle of July, maybe. So 12 or 13 months. We really had, we had to move forward. And the property was perfect. The property was absolutely perfect. Amazing. The money was really, really scary. And it was very stressful mm. for a long time. But that was the start of, of getting here and, and making this happen. It can be really hard to get support for buying a property. You know, people want to donate to rescue elephants and that sort of thing. But, you know, when it comes to, hey, donate so we can buy this piece of property that's a million dollars and then put million dollar fencing on it you know it's not you don't generally get the same level of excitement but what we did have mm. was a very small but solid base of followers who knew scott from his work in tennessee and trusted in the vision for elephants and what that would mean here and that grew little by little and and I, I know we're running out of time. And let me just say, because, uh, you know, we have so many details to talk about in other episodes, but this million dollar property is now fully paid for. We were Fantastic. incredibly fortunate, thanks to a beautiful contact from Petter and Joyce uh, from El uh, Elephant Voices. They actually contacted friends of theirs and supporters of theirs and said, can you help us out? 
uh, we are at the end of the payments. Uh, this was a couple of years ago now, and we need $400,000 to finish all the payments. Um, and they did. And they made uh, wow. uh, two members of the family donated two hundred thousand dollars each to conclude the property payments. So, right now uh, we have no more property payments. Uh, it's a beautiful place to be for a young nonprofit, and uh, never would have imagined it worked out this way. But uh, the land is fully secured and and for the sanctuary for the rest of its existence. That is so wonderful. Which is actually a huge thing. I mean, we I just had somebody email a couple of days ago asking if we own the property because she had said that she was following a different organization and the land they use is leased and the owner doesn't want to lease it to them anymore. And now they're talking about having to rehome elephants and she didn't realize that was even a thing. And she was so concerned and she wanted to make sure that our girls, you know, weren't going to be uprooted and so on and so on. And I was able to tell her, nope, this land is paid for and owned by Elephant Sanctuary Brazil and it's theirs forever. It's not only buying the property, but you obviously have to develop it as well because Guido and Maya were your first elephant. So they don't just come off the lorry and just wander around. You needed fences. So you had like double the amount of money you really had to to, to raise. So that is just amazing. How wonderful that you met all these like-minded people who were just supportive of what you were doing. That is just so, yeah, very heartwarming, lovely. Yeah, it is one of those things that we talk about. You know, it's so hard for people to get up and running with these type of projects because it's not logical and it's daunting. I mean, <clears throat> we definitely lost sleep over land payments and, you know, loads of steel that cost $40,000 for one load when you know you need 30 to build the fence that you're doing. It's a lot, but, you know, as we mentioned earlier, It's so hard to walk away, especially after being in the U.S. and working with rescuing elephants for so many years and knowing how hard it is, you know, people working 15 years to get one elephant out of a zoo and it doesn't even happen. Yet on our first visit, people asked us to take their elephants and of course, Ramba. So they're really, although there were a lot of questions, it wasn't a question as to whether we could at least try and see what we can make happen. Somebody recently asked me why why is the why are the female Asian yards the initial yards smaller than the initial yards for the Africans and the male Asian, and the simple answer was we could only only afford one load of steel, uh, yeah. and that one load of steel had to build the corrals in the barn, and the first yard <laughs> to receive my Ankita. and I think we had yeah. you know an extra three meter piece when we were all done with that. We had just enough to do it. And that's why, you know, at that time in development, the priorities shift and it's challenging. The financial challenges continue and uh, it's daunting as Kat said, uh, but you know, we can get more into that, the nuances of what it means to actually run a sanctuary and build a sanctuary in the coming episodes. Definitely. So after episode eight, we have finally arrived at the sanctuary. (laughs) Next time we can then uh, talk about building the fences, preparing everything, and then welcoming your first two elephants, Guido and Maya. We did talk about them in the last episode as well, when we talked about stereotypical behavior and uh, the trauma of elephants. So yes, with a couple of minutes left, we're right on time. So thank you for your time out of your busy schedule. Just briefly, what are you going to be doing today? Is it elephant feeding time again? Elephant dinner? I don't know what time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, we're running through the things that are <laughs> running through the long list of things that still need need to be done today. Uh, no, I think the next thing is going to be elephant care, uh, elephant feeding, checking on everybody. I have uh, to go get some okay. vines and branches for the deer. Yeah, cats. trying to find his favorite stuff to make sure he eats what he needs to. So I am a deer chef this week. Nadia, thanks again for this. Uh, we appreciate the opportunity to, to chat with you and uh, looking forward to continuing to the next episodes to share more of the many nuances as you have <laughs> learned in I the last couple of episodes. I think the word nuances can be actually the drinking game. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great idea. Okay, catch up next time. Have a great week. Thank you, Nadia. Bye, Nadia. Bye. And that concludes episode eight. We have finally arrived at the magnificent property, which is home for six female Asian elephants currently at Elephant Sanctuary Brazil. More to come. Do send us an email. Uh, The email is podcast at globalelephants.org and like and subscribe to the podcast to make sure you never miss another episode. Take care and catch up in two weeks time. 
Bye. Bye. <laughs>